Historically, has only been used in game development, but in recent times, has seen more use in building distributed systems. So this is the structure of my talk. First, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the drawbacks of building systems with the traditional <coughs> OOP inheritance style code, which you may have learned from like CS three. And followed by that, I'm going to talk about some uh, a high level overview of what entity component systems are. Um, I'll be mentioning some real life examples of entity component systems after game development. And finally, I'll be walking through a bit of uh, one particular implementation of ECS, which I wrote uh, in Elixir, which is a new language uh, which I'll cover later as well. Okay, so I'm going to start with some of the drawbacks with OP and inheritance. So, when you're building games, how many of you have built, ga built games before? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, in a lot of games, especially console games or very complex games like uh, those games, um, you have you would see a class-based uh, structure similar to this one. So you have some base game object which handles things like rendering, and some of the basic entity st management stuff, and then you subclass that class with some other domain object, like an animal. And then you further subclass it to other domain objects. So in this case, we have a bunny animal and a whale animal. So a bunny can hop, a whale can swim, and then there's a specific kind of whale called a killer whale that can kill and swim because it's also a whale. Uh, but the problem with this sort of uh, hierarchy is that what if you want to introduce a new entity like a killer bunny that can hop and kill. How would, where would this be in this hierarchy? It needs to hop. So then I guess killer bunny has to inherit from bunny. It has to kill. So I guess killer bunny has to inherit from killer whale. But then bunnies don't swim. So it, it's not trivial to introduce entities that have, uh, like the killer bunny that don't fit into an existing hierarchy using standard class-based inheritance. So this is one of the issues that a lot of game developers face um, as the game grows more and more complex. The tree will grow deeper and deeper and it gets harder and harder to introduce new domains and new uh, entities. So here are some of the challenges that like, game developers face. Uh, first is the diamond problem. So we've seen a bit of this in the previous slide, but the idea is, let's say B and C override some method in class A. So these are classes. So B and C override some method in class A, and then D comes along, again the killer bunny perhaps, and inherits from both B and C. The question is which version of the overridden method that D inherits? The one that's overridden by B or the one that's overridden by C. It's not clear. Another issue is again you end up with very deep rigid hierarchies. For example, this is a, a typical hierarchy for a game. We have, for example, we have a vehicle class and a human class. In a vehicle, there are many types of vehicles like cars, like tanks, like jetpacks. Humans, there are many kinds of humans pedestrians, players, aliens. But what if you want to make an alien tank. It's not as easy. And another tendency with hierarchies is you end up with this entity pattern where a huge single root class, for example the C entity or the game object class, ends up with a large amount of either functionality or attributes or fields. Um, most of the time, once you have this, 
a lot of his subclasses will have to inherit stuff that they, they don't use. So this is this happens quite often. Okay, so that was some of the drawbacks with traditional OP inheritance style code. Next, we talk about I'll talk about uh, I'll give you a brief introduction of what entity component systems are. So again, traditionally, it's used in game development um, because of the problems we've seen. Um, they tend up they tend to end up with very complex or monolithic classes when using inheritance, and again has some issues associated with it. So some of the games that have used entity mode systems include Thief, Dungeon Siege, Caves of Cut, a lot of uh, games like roguelikes. And the point of the design pattern is it attempts to solve the issues that you've seen in the previous slides. And this design pattern is based on three abstractions, an entity, the component, and the system, as the name suggests. So we briefly going through all these uh, these three key abstractions in the next section. So I'm going to start with the component. So a component is a quality or an aspect of a domain object. So they are minimal reusable data objects that are plugged into entities to spot some behavior. So let me just go straight to the example. So here's a question. What qualities might a bunny have? Asta. So one of the quali qualities that a bunny might have is it eats. Maybe it has a hunger meter somewhere. Another quality is it's fluffy. It's a hug, hug, hug value or something. If you hug it. What other qualities might a bunny have? Yes. Die from loneliness. Okay, that's one. Yeah, cool. Yeah, it works, it works. Any other suggestions? Like what do you mean? <laughs> okay. There's a sticker for the next person who. Yeah. <laughs> no one? Any answer is correct. Just, just give one. Uh, droopy ears. Droopy ears, yeah, oh that's one. <laughs> okay, so here's some suggestions. So a bunny might have a placeable component. It can exist somewhere in the world. Uh, it sees, it has a seeing component with some attributes. It's living, it's huggable, it's consumable, it's hopping, and it's physical. And of course, this is not the only possible components can have any other components that you can think of. So this is a component. A component are minimal, reusable data objects that support some behavior. It takes an entity with a single quality. For example, again, as we've seen, it's living. And it's just a data object. There's no behavior. It's just like a dictionary or a struct with some attributes. Anyone play, anyone play so far? So the second key abstraction of ECS is the entity. An entity is ag an aggregation of components. It's implementation-wise, implementation -wise, it's typically an ID and then and an array of components, <coughs> nothing else. It's just a container of components. And a component gives an entity its data. So when we think of the bunny entity, it's really nothing more but the set of components that it, it is, yes. For example, this dash line is the binary entity, and it contains these components. We might have another entity with a different set of components. For example, the carrot component has a placeable component, a consumable and physical, but not seen, not living, and not huggable. So again, the entity is just an aggregation of components, and nothing else. So this is another example, a ghost entity. It's placeable, it's seen, and it's spooky. So finally, the most interesting abstraction in ECS is a system. So the system is what brings entities and components to life. It's what gives them behavior. So a component just gives you state, just the data, no functions that are on it, it's just data. But the systems 
are the ones that run continuously in some like a background thread over all the components that it's in charge of. For example, we could have a gravity component that runs over all components of uh, placeable components. And systems read and write the state of the components and publish new state resulting in behavior. And again, it only updates components. But because entity has components, by transitive property, entities themselves will be So here's an example. Uh, maybe you want to have uh, a gravity, some kind of gravity, you know, uh, game. So we want it so that placeable components with a z value more than 10, over time would just reach the zero and get things fall to the ground. Or maybe you want to make sure that things age in our world. So for example, all living components will have its age increase over time. So who takes charge of these rules that govern the system? This is systems. For example, on the left side we have a gravity system that makes sure that again things fall to the ground. And a time system that makes sure that time passes and things age. So these systems have only a single responsibility. For example, as you see, a gravity system is only concerned with things that fall down. A time system is only concerned with time. So here's a typical data flow in entity coordinate systems. If some event stream, which could be like a stream of timestamps or a stream of failure events, uh, it gets pushed into the gravity systems, which then responds to those events by publishing state updates to all the components that it's in charge of. Yep. Uh, any questions so far? You can stop me anytime if you were not clear. Okay. I'll just maybe repeat this part again. So again, a gravity system will enumerate over all the components that it's in charge of and publish state changes based on some event. And that gives the components and by extension entities behavior. So here's another just quick overview. So the data flow goes like this. We start with the system, which listens to some outside events, like a time event or some player input on keyboard press. And the systems provide the logic that manipulates the data in the individual components. Components listens to these uh, system events and updates the state. So it's just it's just a bucket of data. It just stores data, changes when people, when other parts of the code tells it to change, specifically the systems. And finally, the entities, because it has access, access to components, acquire behavior due to state changes. So here's another way to maybe help you think about ECS. Uh, you can think of it as like a relational table. So each row in this table is an entity. So again, an entity is an ID and a collection of components. So in the first row, you have an entity with ID one, the components name, position, shape, and friends. An entity can have any combination of components. So here's an example of systems that uh, manage multiple components at the same time. So for example, in the first table, uh, the position entities with both a position and sum components are highlighted. Maybe you have a positional sum system that increases volume based on how far you are to things. Uh, those, those systems will enumerate over all entities with a particular set of components and updates its state according to some rules. This is another subset. So, I hope everyone's clear about the basics um, of the component systems. Any other questions if I move on? Yes. Uh, if, you have, uh, if you want to create some kind of behavior that mm. affects like two components working together, the same time, yeah. kind of, mm. where do you put it? Mm. So just to clarify again, so you have two components. Uh, you have a system that wants to modify two components at the same time. Uh, where, where like, um, the state of two components interact with each other. 
or, or you want to develop like some kind of compound component? Yes. Uh, there's a session later on, uh, which, which I'll cover. All right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. So some of the good things about ECS is first thing is it's good decoupling because for example you have let's say you have a game, you have a physics system, you have an AI system, you have a pathfinding system, you have a gravity system, these systems are decoupled from each other. They only operate on different uh, components and different uh, fields. There's a clear separation of responsibility again, each component does one thing. And so it encourages small interfaces and you can do for example, this is how you build a component. You just pass in a uh, build an entity. You just pass in the components that it's it has. That's it. Uh, it's, it has easier use and composability. For example, again you can sort of unlike the inheritance tree structure we've seen, you can choose any subset, pick out any subset of your components and plug it in to the entities. Straightforward unit testing and mocking. Each component again is has a single responsibility, and by definition, it's a single component is like a unit, so you can test it fairly straightforward. And you can also substitute components, for example, with mock or demo components at runtime. Uh, another another uh, benefit is that you separate the data from the functions that act on it. Means that, for example, you have a, the same component, but you could have different kind of systems that act on those components. For example, we have a gravity component. Maybe you can have a wind component that behaves differently. Uh, you can also define objects at runtime. For example, as you've seen, entity or do something. You can do it at runtime without having to like, uh, actually write the code twice and plug, it, plug all the uh, components in your code. And, and it's also parallelizable because systems, you can very easily just turn into a worker pool and distribute it over multiple machines. So, but there are challenges uh, to ECSS. Yeah, you have this point out. So, the first thing is most people have never even heard of ECS before. How many of you have heard of ECS before the stop? Oh, more than I expected. But most people still haven't heard of. Where, who, who, who raised their hands? So, where have you heard of ECS? <laughs> oh, really? Yes. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. <laughs> But before his talk, do you do you know what ECS is? Yeah. Thing is, most people have never even heard of this. So it makes discussions. For example, oh, I want to make a web app using ECS. How do you do it? There's no. You don't know where to start, other than doing it yourself. And the second problem is you have to handle inter-process communication. So, for example, how do you handle? The state updates from systems to components. Depending on the language, most of the time you don't have the instructions to send messages between processes. For example, if you're talking about uh, Elixir, we have some abstractions for doing that, but looking at other languages like Java or C, you might have to use some other like message bus or some part of some system library or something that's not part of the built in abstractions. So that's another complexity, one complexity. And another challenge is inter-component communication. Is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question is, what happens when a system needs to access and or update multiple components? So for example, if you look back at this, what if you have one system that accesses both sound and position and needs to read the state of both and update both? Is that? Oh, uh, yeah. Or let's like say when the when a system updates on sound requires input from mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. Yep. So one of there are many there are a couple of solutions to that. Again, uh, one of the you may go to this point first. So ECS is not as concrete concretely defined as other patterns like MVC. There are many flavors and many a lot of different impl possible implementations depending on your use case. So to support that use case where components need to essentially talk to each other or at least know for each other state, you might need to have another channel for components belonging to the same entity so they can synchronize and decide. Yeah. 
So again, this point is this introduced some other complexity that you have to consider if you're building an ECS. Another challenge is inter-system communication. What happens when two systems need to access the same component? For example, if we have two components, uh, one multiplies by minus one, one adds by ten, and applies to a value. Depending on the order of operations, which system acts first, the result will be different. So how do you decide? So again, this is up to you. You can either order it in some way, or you can make sure that all your components are commutative, that the order doesn't matter somehow. Again, it's up to you. Again, there are many possible conditions. It's not uh, like a rigid definition. So that's one more challenge. Uh, ch okay, the last challenge is the instantiation of entities is more involved. So some of the question is here is like who or which component wires up the components? If you have like a bunny component, does the bunny class or component wise up its own components? I mean entity, um, does the bunny entity wise up its own components or some other maybe world object or world class that handles that? Again, the point is who manages what and who knows about who? Right, so does the entity itself create its own component? Or does some outside code provides the components? Oh, this is a picture of a message bus. So this is like, a, for example, if you're using Java or C, you might not have like this pops up pattern built in the language. So you, you have to maybe add it to your system to facilitate the process communication. <coughs> How do you do my time? So next, I'm going to show you some real-life applications of ECS outside of games. So recently, there's this startup called Improbable, uh, which has developed a product called Spatial OS. It's essentially entity component systems as a service. Um, some of the uses for this product has been for simulating large-scale uh, worlds. For example, as urban traffic simulations, this is a uh, monitoring system for a multiplayer game with hundreds of thousands of entities. And this is a network simulation, uh, internet topology, network topology simulation, where you can check if, for example, if this particular router in the UK goes off, what will happen to the rest of the network. Again. And with all of these, the common thing is they are large-scale distributed simulations based on the ECS pattern. Yeah. And this is like a, the common architecture. Again, if you look at it, we have an entity, which are themselves consisting, consists of multiple components, like a physics component, an AI component, cloud funding, that is backed by some systems. In this case, it's like a distributed uh, worker pool. Yeah. So this is how it's being used now. Okay, finally, some more attractive, more attractive section. And I'll be going through some, uh, some details about one particular implementation which I wrote in Elixir. Um, but before that, how many of you have heard of Elixir before? How many of you have used Elixir or written a library in Elixir? Yeah, Elixir is pretty cool. You should, you should give it a try. So Elixir is a, a relatively new language. I think it's uh, not older than three or four years. Um, it's a language that compares to Erlang. How many of you have heard of Erlang? Okay. Oh, cool. So Erlang is most famous uh, because it's used by WhatsApp, where they publish numbers, some crazy number where they have one machine, one box, running two million web socket connections at the same time. So it's some crazy number. And they do it because of the fam famous Erlang VM. Uh, Erlang is a language developed in the uh, 70s or 80s by, Sony er by Ericsson, of Sony Ericsson. And it's used for telecommunications like switching. And the reason, and one of the taglines is nine nines of reliability. So when you pick up a phone, you don't expect 
someone to be responding to say, oh, sorry, we're down for maintenance. No, it has to be up, no matter what. So the tagline for Erlang is that it has nine nines of reliability. It means 99.999999% uptime. It means it's up that, that much time. So companies that have used Erlang uh, include WhatsApp, again for the main chat, Facebook Messenger, and some open source project which you may have used before, like RabbitMQ, which is like a message broker, and React, which is like a distributed data store. So the cool things about Elixir is there's some built-in concurrency abstractions. How many of you have used uh, Scala or Akka? Or have heard of Scala or Akka? Right. So Scala and Akka, Akka is like a actor library for Scala. And an actor is like a concurrency primitive, which I'll briefly explain in the next slide. And Akka is actually inspired by another language. Can someone name it, name this other language? Who, what other language inspired Akka's actor library? Erlang. Who said that? <laughs> yeah, Mamun. <laughs> yeah, question. Can I use Erlang? Yeah, of course. So it's Erlang. And with Elixir, we can use the Erlang actor system directly. So it's built in concurrency abstractions, which I'll go through next. Um, but at the same time, again, Erlang is a very old language. So as you imagine, can you imagine the syntax? Not the best. Uh, which is why Elixir came along with a pleasant modern syntax that's very similar to Ruby. As you'll see, we'll, we'll see some code later, and I think you can agree. Uh, it's immutable and functional. Immutable meaning you can't change state. There's no such thing as an object state. There's no such thing as an instance method. Again, we'll talk about that. And it's functional. It's gradual types, meaning that you can specify types, but you don't need them. And they exist purely as a, sh uh, as a tool to help you make sure that things work at compound time. As pattern matching, again, there's a demo for it. You can call Erlang code from Elixir. It's very straightforward. It has method programming capabilities. If you've used Ruby before, Elixir's method programming is way cooler, way more powerful. So again, before I go to the code, I have to just briefly explain the actor model so it makes a tiny bit more sense. So an actor model is a, a concurrency primitive. And the definition is actors are computational things that can send messages to other actors, receive messages from other actors, and create other actors. I'm just going to repeat this again. So actors can send messages to other actors, receive messages from other actors, and create other actors. So for example, you have this diagram here. You have an actor A who sends two messages to actor C. Similarly, there's actor B that sends a message to C. And in response to these messages, actor C can do any of those things. You can send messages, maybe back to A, maybe back to another, or to some other actor, or you can spawn new actors so that you can distribute the work to other actors, for example. So actors here, are in Elixir, these actors are called processes. And it's the key abstraction in Elixir's and Erlang's concurrency model. I'm just going to uh, start with the demo. Is this big enough? Open IEX, which is the uh, Elixir interpreter. 
Um, let's create an actor, a process, I mean, the same thing. So here I'm creating a new actor that's supposed to listen for messages from other actors. And receive takes is like sort of similar to a switch case where it accepts messages of a particular format. So this is pattern matching, which I'll explain again uh, later. It takes messages of the format uh, that looks like a tuple with two items, a sender and a message. And then in response to that message, we will output a message that says, oh, this other actor sent a message. Okay. So it created an actor and it returns a PID. A PID is a process ID. It's an address of where that actor lives, essentially. So now, we can send this actor, Jeff, a message. Before that, I uh, just want to make sure that, so the terminal itself is also an actor. So let's send Jeff a message. We'll tell it, oh, I'm a, I am the sender, and this is the message I want to send to Jeff. So what happened? We sent Jeff a message. Jeff listened and responded, oh, this PID sent this message. And the last, the third line is just a return value from the send. Yeah. So that's the basic concurrency primitive in Elixir. As you see, we saw three things. Spawn creates new actors. Receive listens to messages from other actors. And send sends messages to other actors. And with these basic primitives, you can build distributed systems. But you can screw it up pretty quickly if you do it with only those three primitives. Which is why Erlang has this thing called the Erlang OTP. OTP stands from Open Telecom Network, but Telecom Platform, but it doesn't really mean anything. Um, it's a collection of battle-tested distributed systems patterns for building fault tolerant applications. So one of these uh, patterns is something called a gen circle. Essentially, it's like a high level abstraction for concurrent building distributed systems. So I'm going to show you an example gen circle. So this is a gen circle. So again, this is uh, an extra syntax. As you can see, it's pretty readable. It's like Ruby. Yeah, cool. So, let's start with the bottom here. So the bottom half here defines how the server or the actor responds to different types of messages. <coughs> this is another thing about Elixir is that it has pattern matching. For example, you can see three different functions. They have the same number of arguments, but different parameters. I mean, the same number of parameters with different arguments. So for example, the first handle call takes in a click. The second handle calls takes a click as the first parameter. And the third handle call takes some tuple as a parameter. So this is, uh, it looks, pattern matching is a way to declaratively describe which functions get dispatched when, depending on the parameters. And <laughs> okay. so, yeah. So again, this defines how the actor responds to messages. And the top part is just uh, some syntax sugar to make calling, uh, sending different messages uh, more easily. So you can just have like a method call to this module. Okay, that's a gen server. So next, we're going to look at uh, ECS implementation in Elixir. Um, yeah, so we're basically building this. It's a bunny holding a clock. Okay. 
I'm just going to start up the system. So let's create a bunny. So again, I'm just showing you how an NP system and ECS might work, and later on we'll go through actually the uh, implementation details. So this creates a entity, a single component called a time component. And we pass it some parameter, for example, each. So, so this bunny entity, as you can see, has a list of components and an ID. So this ID is just used for us for reference. It's some metadata that helps us find where the entity is. And we also have a time system. So the time system, again, enumerates over all components that it's in charge of and updates its state according to some event. In this case, the event is I make the time system do something. Right. So let's check the bunny again. Oh, why is it still zero? Any ideas? It's because some of, because one of the things about Elixir. Any ideas? Why is it zero still? Even though immutability. it's immutable, exactly. Immutable. Object never changed. So here's another question for if you are trying to use immutable images. I have like a reload method. In normal object-oriented languages or mutable languages, this would work, but it doesn't work for uh, immutable languages. Why? They're not, because there are no such thing as instance methods. They're only class methods. So, so this returns the actual new state. Okay, here's another, another question. If I go bunny again, why? Why hasn't it? Because it's immutable, exactly. So the entity reload returns a new object with the latest state. And the bunny wasn't modified at all. So what you should do instead is something like this. This gives you the actual state. So let's try another thing. <coughs> let's add a component to this entity at one time. Each, so we can tell the difference. And now our bunny has two time components. It's holding two clocks. One within each of four, and one within each of hundred. And so we can just create, uh, extend entities at runtime. I'm using just a simple time system, a uh, time component, but for production use, you can use any kind of component. This is just the basic of, uh, overview of how an ECS works. Any questions? Sorry, uh, yes. 
Uh, I wasn't really following. So for the when the system updates the components are the comp let's say for uh, each each component, right? Mm. Is the each component shared among all the entities or no. no. A component only belongs to one entity. And then so uh, but you only update the component. So we call reload you will actually look for the component and then update yes, the exactly. ah, okay. Or rather it pulls the latest statement. Ah, okay. so, yeah. <coughs> so let's look at the actual implementation. Again, we've only seen how things would work. So let's look at the component itself. So component again, actually no, let's start with the entity. So an entity is just an ID some components. It's an array of components. And, oh, and this is an example of gradual typing in uh, Elixir. For example, if you notice, at each method, I have something called an a spec, which defines the types, the input and outputs of this method. But actually, if I remove this, the code will still run. Because Elixir is gradual typing. It means that it's not compulsory to have proper types in your code. It just helps you debug it when you compile. Yeah. Means that if you don't have this, it will still run at runtime. So that's something called gradual typing. If you're interested, you can go for it. Um, so for example, with types, I can define how my things look. I have an ID type, something called an ID, which is a string, components, which is a list of component. And yeah. So here, when we build a new entity, you can see it's just a data object. It just returns a struct or a dictionary with some random ID and the components. That's it. It's quite simple. Let's look at a component. Component has an ID, again, just for reference, and state. So a component is a data object. Again, it's a reusable data object for a specific responsibility or purpose. Uh, when you create a new component, this might not be it. That's not, this might not make sense <laughs> if you don't know how it works. So when you create a new component, we create a new process to keep state. We register that process into some common registry for our systems to access, and that's it. And below is just some uh, setters and getters for the state for the system. Finally, have a system. So this is a time system. It has single, uh, has a single public method called process, which enumerates over all the components that it's in charge of. And what's this? Anyone tell me what this is? The highlight, this, this one? What's this? What, what, operator, what, what, what is this operator called? If you use bash, I think you should know this. Type in the small. Okay, I think you said it first. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's a pipe. It's a pipe. Okay, let me just demo. This is one of the two things about Elixir. So normally, let's say you have a string. A, B, C, D. You want to make it uh, all uppercase. So you type this. Oh, but I changed my mind. I want to do it, make everything down case afterwards. And lower case. You'd see this code a lot. Like nested method calls. So this can get so bad that you have to extract, oh, that parameter there should go to a variable first, above, so it's more clear. But if you have pipes, you can do it differently. <laughs> you can model your code as a series of data transformations from one input to another and pass it on to the next. So this leads to quite very, a lot of readable code in Elixir if you write a library. And you see, see a lot of libraries use this pattern a lot. So, so, the, so in the process method, again, for each component, 
to trigger a dispatch. So a dispatch here, how many of you have done functional reactive programming? Have, how many have heard of OGIT? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so this is sort of a bit inspired by functional reactive programming. I think if you use something like uh, React Redux, you would come across this. Um, the dispatch here is a pure reducer. It takes some state, an action, and returns a new state based on that action. So for example, the new state here, so again, it's like a switch case. Depending on the kind of event that your system receives, how does that affect the state? Essentially, this is what the dispatch method does. If, it if there's like an increment event somewhere, then the state would look like this. If there's a decrement event somewhere, it would do this. Otherwise, it just returns. So this is a example of a pure reducer. If you want to learn more, you can try looking at L, which is another language. Uh, but I won't go into too much detail. And uh, that's it. Okay, so that's pretty much most of the content. But if I close, uh, let you just uh, just conclude. So, entity component system is an overlooked architectural pattern <coughs> that is mostly used for game development. Um, it overcomes some of the drawbacks of OP style inheritance and it has become a great fit for distributed systems. Again, you've seen startups just building ECS type <coughs> services. And another thing is branching out into unfamiliar domains, so I'm not exactly a game developer. But actually, ECS is mostly for game development. And I think it's nice to go into domains that you're not necessarily a part of, to learn more about things that you would not otherwise come across. So before I close, I'd like to share with you an excerpt of the talk. So we have a local copy. Model programming is about programming models in the first place. So let me explain what I mean by that. The here's what I think a worst case scenario would be is if the next generation of programmers grows up never being exposed to these ideas. The next generation the next generation of programmers grows up only being shown one way of thinking about programming. So they kind of work on that way of programming, they, they flush out all the details, they you know, kind of solve that particular model of programming, they, they figured it all out. And then they teach that to the next generation. So that second generation then grows up thinking, oh, it's all been figured out. We know what programming is. We know what we're doing. They grow up with dogma. And once you grow up with dogma, it's really hard to break out of it. Do you know the reason why all these ideas and so many other good ideas came about in this particular time period, the 60s, early 70s? Why did it all happen then? It's because technology, it was, it was late enough that technology kind of got to the point where you could actually kind of do things with computers, but it was still early enough that nobody knew what programming was. Nobody knew what programming was supposed to be. And they knew they didn't know, so they just like tried everything. Their minds were totally free, and they just like said, maybe we can program like this, maybe we can program like that. They just you know, tried anything they could think of. So the most dangerous thought that you're going to have as a creative person is to think that you know what you're doing. Because once you think you know what you're doing, you stop looking around for other ways of doing things. And you stop being able to see other ways of doing things. You become blind. You become like, like these guys over here, kind of coding along in binary. Someone shows them assembly language. Someone, someone shows them Fortran. And they, they can't even see it. It just goes right over their head. Because they know what they're doing. They know what programming is. This is programming. That's not programming. And so they totally miss out on this much more powerful way of thinking. 
So the message of this talk, you know, it, it's not really, it's not really the stuff, right? The message of this talk is, if you don't want to be this guy, if you want to be open and receptive to new ways of thinking, to invent new ways of thinking, I think the first step is you have to say to yourself, I don't know what I'm doing. We as a field don't know what we're doing. I think you have to say, we don't know what programming is. We don't know what computing is. We don't even know what a computer is. And once you truly understand that, and once you truly believe that, then you're free. And you can think anything. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Okay. Just stop me afterwards. Any questions? <laughs>